My name is Bijal Shah, Marketing and Trade Show Executive here at J Global. Let me go ahead and start off by introducing today's session on optimizing your disaster recovery infrastructure using Active Data Guard. I'd like to introduce Manoj Machiwal. He is one of our consulting directors here at J Global. I've gone ahead and listed his contact details. Manoj.Machiwal at jglobal.com, as well as his phone number. And again, I am Vijal Shah, Marketing and Trade Show Executive here at Jade Global, and your moderator for today's webinar. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Manoj now, who will review the agenda, tell you a little bit about Jade, and go ahead and continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Manoj. Thanks, Vijal, uh, for the introduction. And uh, let's uh, jump into the agenda straight, but before I jump into the agenda, the purpose uh, of the today's educational webinar, uh, how to educate you guys uh, on the replication solutions and the disaster recovery solution which Oracle had traditionally and how they evolved over a period of time and uh, what are the advantage of each one of them and uh, why Active Data Guard and when it can be used in different scenarios. So initially we'll talk about the different high availability solutions available with the Oracle databases. Then we'll talk about some of the traditional solutions and then we'll give you a brief overview about Active Data Guard and then we'll go a little more detail in the technical side, how we actually enable the Active Data Guard and what are some of the cool features of Active Data Guard and how you do the Data Guard broker setup in terms of Active Data Guard. And finally, some of the maintenance tips and uh, we'll conclude with a customer case study and uh, in the end, I will take a few of the questions and answers. All right? So let's move on. So let's talk about uh, traditional disaster recovery solutions. So if you see most of the companies, uh, disaster recovery is something that people always want to have some kind of disaster recovery solution, but most of the time they hardly use that whole infrastructure during the whole year and probably they might be doing some disaster recovery drill for once or twice a year. That's about it. Until you have some kind of a major uh, geographical challenge, catastrophic challenge, some earthquakes or some flood situation or other cases, it might be like a single point of failure where one server failed and you have to rely on a different server. But in most of the cases, you have seen that tradi traditional disaster recovery solution, your disaster recovery site is always constantly duplicating to the primary site, but it is actually being idle and not getting utilized for any productive work. So that means you are wasting those whole infrastructure resources for most of the time, which is just getting unused and you're just replicating and uh, waiting for disaster to happen when it can be used, right? So so, it's a, so that way it is very expensive to constantly maintain that such an ideal in, idle infrastructure over a long period of time and just waiting for disaster to happen and uh, not utilizing that infrastructure for anything else, right? So, so if you talk about the Oracle Data Guard solution, so Oracle has uh, Data Guard for a long, long time right now, uh, starting I think uh, the 99 database itself. But uh, over a period of time, they have evolved the Data Guard solution, and that is one of the high availability and DR solution Oracle provides that. So in case of high availability, like uh, you can have a multiple primary site which is replicated through the uh, through the Data Guard. However, you can have a secondary site where Data Guard is constantly replicating to the standby side, but again it is listening, listen only mode, right? And uh, problem is that that uh, there is a uh, again you have got some advantage because of the built-in Oracle integration, because it addresses some of the plan and plan downtime where you can bring up the secondary side and uh, do some kind of maintenance on the primary. And uh, but it's still the basic challenge which we had in the traditional solution that your disaster recovery site is still is idle and redundant and it's only used in case of any disaster happen. And again, that will be like, I would say 1% of the total time. And uh, But you have to put all the efforts to maintain and make sure that site is up and running always, right? So there's a cost associated to maintain uh, uptime and making sure that all replication is happening correctly. But uh, Again, it is redundant most of the time. All right. So let's talk about Active Data Guard now. So starting Oracle Database 11G, Oracle has released a new product in the line of Data Guard, which is Active Data Guard. So as the name says, right, Active, it's not passive anymore. So you can actually, uh, in the earlier version of the database, when you are replicating using Data Guard, you cannot open the database for 
any purpose. But uh, with Active Data Guard, you can actually open the standby site in a read-only mode where you can actually read the data, you can offload some of the reporting operations to the standby site and you can build your reporting infrastructure on the standby site. So it brings a great advantage for the people running heavy reporting infrastructure, doing a lot of different work uh, which uh, needs real time of data but they cannot kind of uh, load their primary system with that reporting resourcing requirement. So now they have alternate solution they can use Active Data Guard running their reporting infrastructure from the secondary side. At the same time, you can also offload a lot of backups and uh, other activities which is more of the IO, and, uh, IO processing activities from a primary to a secondary side. Okay? So, so that brings up a uh, very good advantage for a lot of people where they can use the secondary side more effectively active manner. That's how the term Active Data Guard uh, came up with. Okay? So let's talk about how do you enable Active Data Guard in Database 11D. So we are getting into the more technical discussion here. So you can actually do multiple different ways here. Uh, one of the ways is uh, you can directly use uh, SQL Plus, right? You just uh, under database recover managed standby database. That's a pretty standard command to involve the data guard using that SQL Plus, right? But uh, if physical standby database uh, is uh, shut down, then you can always open that, that in read only and start Redo Apply. Okay. Now another scenario might be your Redo Apply might be already running, right? So how do you do that, right? So your if Redo Apply is already running, then you just uh, open the database in read only and recover managed standby using current log file defined. So that means it will start the database open. Uh, it you know, read only mode and your uh, log file continuously redo apply is also working at the same time. Right? And uh, the another way is uh, the uh, best way to do it, I think, using the data guard broker because that way you have more control on uh, different configurations. And uh, so using data guard broker, you can uh, broker, uh, if you do the 11 gr 2 then the broker automatically stops the redo apply and starts the database with 11 gr 2 but if you are on the, I think, uh, release one, then you have to stop the redo apply first before you can restart the database in open only mode, right? So let's talk about some of the cool features, right? So there are certain uh, write operations also you can do to the primary using uh, active data guard. But again, those uh, those are uh, those can be done through some kind of a database link and uh, only preferred in case you have some kind of a reference or sequence numbers in the reporting uh, query which you are running. Uh, it's not recommended to do too many write operations using Active Data Guard. That's like the uh, multi-way replication uh, in a sense. But uh, Active Data Guard should be primarily used more of the reporting purpose only. And uh, another way is like uh, whenever uh, a standby site uh, kind of detects a block corruption on a primary site, Active Data Guard has a process where it can actually correct, uh, in, invoke a process of uh, automatic repairing of a block corruption in primary site and the vice versa. So, so that's another cool feature where you can actually help uh, to reduce the block corruption, data block corruption uh, automatically using these features. All right. So these are some of the more detailed Data Guard broker setup steps. These are more detailed uh, technical steps uh, as you can see. You can actually connect the states and uh, create your DR solution configuration in the data, data guard uh, uh, kind of a control panel DGM GRL and uh, once you create the configuration on the primary database, you can say show configuration and it, by default it shows for the maximum performance and uh, primary database is that. And fast start failover shows disabled, but you can enable it later on depending on the requirement, right? What kind of requirement you have to set up the data guard. And uh, now to the secondary side, it uh, shows that it's a reporting database and uh, if you say the database configuration is again a maximum performance, primary database is a primary database and reporting database is a physical stand 
standby and again fast start failover is disabled here. So how do you uh, actually maintain an active data guard environment like what on a day-to-day -day basis how do you figure out uh, whether your database active data guard is enabled so you can check very easily just uh, run a query on a database and check the open mode and it will show you read only the reply that means your logs are applying and database is open in a read only mode and uh, another important thing for a maintenance purpose you always need to know how far behind is your standby site from primary database so you can check that from some of other dictionary views like read all data guard stats where you can check the how much is the difference in the apply lab and uh, also you can check uh, through read all standby even histograms again uh, where the apply lag is one of them and you can check how far is this the primary and secondary is and another way as a usual way you, you see uh, I used to see earlier you can check the system change number on both of the sites and you can also check the sequence number the redo sequence number on the both primary and secondary which also gives you a straight forward uh, how far your primary and secondary sites are far behind. Alright, so let's talk about some of the uh, customer case study that I was talking to, right? So company which we uh, actually started, implemented Active Data Guard is a solar manufacturing company and uh, they are uh, running their whole manufacturing operations on uh, Accelerator infrastructure which is a 11G R2 environment, 2 node rack on an Accelerator machine and uh, they were running their factory operations, their MES reporting, everything on that uh, infrastructure. So as you can see that Accelerator is a pretty powerful machine even though it can support all the reporting and everything as well as the transactional data of factory operations which maintains like uh, whole the order history, warranty history, the parts, inventory, everything and anything on the database and uh, there's some kind of a real time transactional data which was uh, like very large amount of data or transactional data was happening on that. So challenge which our customer had that they were running both their MES reporting as well as the transactional data on the same primary instance even though it was a highly available intense multi-node machine. However, when they were running their MES reporting on top of that, they were seeing sluggish factory operations where they are not able to do their day-to-day -day business more efficiently and performance optimized way on a primary site. And that was the challenge they were facing and they can't afford to have a sluggish factory operations at the cost of reporting. But the reporting is also important because that gives some them insight on how how uh, their uh, supply chain should look like and how their manufacturing operation should, how much more they should produce. So, so both of these things are important but uh, they can't run on each other's cost. So that was the problem uh, the customer was facing. So, Another uh, challenge they face is that uh, the accelerator infrastructure, uh, they need some kind of a patching on that and uh, they were not able to do patch because, patching on that because that is the main factory operations was running, that's a 24 7 model and they can't afford any downtime on that. And, uh, and again, the, they had a high availability infrastructure but uh, not as robust where they can uh, offload one of the site and uh, because performance uh, will degrade if they offload one of the sites for the maintenance and another site is running for the factory operation. So high availability kind of they had to know the, the rack to have some kind of high availability but uh, that was not performance optimized because if you take out one node then uh, another node has a heavy load and uh, they can't sustain their factory operation with that heavy load on one node. So now the challenge was how do you address this so that they have continuously have their high availability infrastructure at the same time they want to run their MES reporting as well. So as you can see their current operation, their Accelerator, they have a quarter rack, they are running their read only 
uh, operations there like that means running any SA holding, read write operations that was their factory uh, transactional data that uh, which is the factory two is constantly putting the data into the access data transactional database which is the R2 and finally there are all the backups also running on the same infrastructure. All right. So we already discussed uh, the issues about the sluggish performance during reporting period and uh, access data machine patching is another issue. And uh, another uh, we are looking for a different solution. They can't another data machine for the standard is very costly for them because uh, they wanted to have something extra data machine on the secondary side which they can use for it. So in the proposed architecture as you see, so we implemented a standby and again a two node rack. However, this time it was not extra data machine but this two node rack was connected through the data guard broker and uh, we were doing active data guard and uh, we worked with the MES reporting team to switch all their operations to a standby side so that all the reporting has been moved from primary side to the secondary side and also we have tested the failover on standby side so that their primary side can be passed. So this whole operation was done in two phases. So first uh, important step they wanted to finish their accelerator patching so that uh, their primary site is uh, up to date on the latest patches. So they switch, uh, they failed over to the secondary site for a limited amount of time until they finished the accelerator patching and then they switched over to the primary and make a standby site as a read only mode where they continuously started running their reports. So their primary site uh, was only supporting the read-write factory operations in a proposed architecture and again uh, backup IO performance was better on the accelerator that's why we had kept the R1 backups on the same primary site as well. Alright? So some of the uh, lessons which you learned during this uh, whole customer case study. Right. So when we did the failover site, so we found out that failover site was not tuned for factory operation because we actually made the failover site considering that it will run only the MES reporting and if, uh, the whole the configurations and uh, all the memory configuration and all the database parameters as well as the resources are assigned such that that will support a reporting infrastructure. And uh, but when we actually did a failover to transitional data, which is a factory operation, it was not uh, tuned uh, to that. And another one reason was extra data versus non extra data environment, where uh, we have not worked on that earlier. And uh, a lot of another another lessons learned that there's a lot of uh, rework has to be done on the reporting query to tune them to a non extra data environment because earlier they were running on extra data environment. And uh, another lesson which we learned, I think uh, the Oracle has a standard feature of where you can do a load capture on the primary database where you not only capture the load, you capture the load concurrency and exactly simulate the whole environment and record that load and then you replay that load on your secondary site or the so that you can kind of do a performance testing. So I think lessons which we learned here that we have to use that feature much more efficiently which would have given some of the performance related issues we would have found out much earlier and would have resolved much better way. And then uh, let's summarize that, uh, that utilization of whole disaster recovery infrastructure has been improved that you are using both the primary and secondary side and uh, were able to use them more efficiently when both of the primary and secondary side are always up and running and so that utilization perspective it was completely utilized rather than sitting idle. Then uh, that again the important thing is the rat capture and rat replay. It's a very good feature which should be used uh, anywhere, anytime you do any kind of a migration, platform migration or anything. It's a very good tool you can use to test your uh, to not only just to move active data guard, but any time you try to plan to move your database to different sites. 